Good morning and welcome to Holy Trinity Church, West Bromwich. Uh, we are here in person and it's good to see everyone and we will be, um, I'll say hello to those who are watching online, welcome to you too. Uh, this morning's service has a theme which is focused on women in particular, um, and you'll see the start of the service, she says, women making church peaceful. Uh, we're going to think about that as we come to one of the most difficult passages in scripture, which I'm approaching with some degree of trembling and anxiety, but I hope uh, as we hear God's word that we will receive it with joy and gladness. So we're going to look at um, our opening words here, and I'll say the light print, you say the bold print. Do stand if you're able, and we'll say the words of preparation together. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has given us Jesus from the dead. In Christ, God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Do take a seat. Morning all. good just to, to come to God now in humility, in um, repentance, because all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so let's take a moment to reflect and then confess our sins that we've committed this week to our loving Heavenly Father. And so we pray, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that through faith in Christ alone, the Lord forgives us all our sins, heals the sicknesses of our souls. The Lord redeems our lives from the grave and crowns us with glory and honour. Amen. What a great gospel. Our, um, our opening song this morning is based on Psalm 42, which you might know begins with the words, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsts after you. It's a song of distress, um, from a place of deep distress, but also uh, a song of hope. I'm going to read you instead from Psalm 102. Psalm 102 has a very similar theme. First two verses. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. We will all be experiencing different feelings through this season, as we, as we do at all times, but particularly with the the sadnesses of the last year, and we all need to be aware of each other's feelings and experiences and care for each other and look after each other's needs. But overall, I think there's that weight of sadness on our nation, isn't there, in the world. And even as we grieve and mourn with those who are suffering in other countries around the world today. So Psalm 102 is one of those psalms of sadness and, and distress. But listen to verse 16 and 17. Uh, if you've got your own Bible with you, you can turn 
with me to it. Verse 15. The nations, the nations will fear the Lord. All the kings of the earth will revere your glory. For the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. So in the middle of our distress, as we come together today, we're going to pray to God and plead with him, cry for mercy. And our first song will help us to acknowledge the sadnesses and feel the hope. So let's um, sit and meditate or sing in your heart, Lord from sorrows deep I call. Should my life be torn from me, every worldly pleasure, when all I possess is grief, God be then my treasure. Lord, we praise you that you are from everlasting to everlasting, that your love is steadfast towards all who know you and trust you. And whatever circumstance we find ourselves in today, we pray that you would be our treasure. Through Jesus Christ our Saviour, by the power of your Spirit we pray. Amen. Let's pray. If you're on if you're order service, we're going to be on the second page, uh, the collect for the fifth Sunday after Easter. Let's pray. O Lord, from whom all good things come, grant to us, your servants, that by your holy inspiration we may think good thoughts and by your merciful guidance put them into practice through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Declare our faith. These words came from our passage last week in 1 Timothy. Let's declare together. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Thanks be to God. God our Saviour wants all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Thanks be to God. There is one God and one mediator between God and us. Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We'll do an introduction to our Bible reading. Uh, I've got some pictures here. I don't know if you can recognise who these people are. The first one's quite obvious, isn't it? You know who he is? Who's that? Mr. Credible. Who knows who this is? You've got Disney Channel, you know? We don't have Disney Channel. No. That's, that's the new version of She Ra. Remember from the 1980s? She Ra and He Man? Well, this is the new She Ra. Here's a question Who would win the argument between, he, between Mr. Credible and She Ra? Hands up, you think Mr. Credible would win? Hands up, you think she would win? Hands up, you don't really care? <laughs> Sorry, if you're watching the screen at home, there's Mr. Credible and she Okay, another one on the back here. Who remembers the A-Team? Anyone remember the A-Team? Yeah, they are. Like, there's the A-Team. And who remembers the Spice Girls? Yeah, so you know, Amanda and I missed the whole Spice Girls thing because we were living in Malaysia when they first became famous. And by the time they got back, they've almost gone out of fashion. So here's a question. Imagine the A-team were arguing angrily about God's law and how you should behave. And now imagine that the Spice Girls appear on the scene and start arguing with the men and trying to tell them to calm down and start bossing them around. Uh, who's going to win the argument between the A-Team and the Spice Girls? Okay, hands up against the A-Team. Okay, hands up against the B-Team. Uh, sorry, B-Team. <laughs> uh, sorry, Spice Girls, you're not the B-Team. Uh, the Spice Girls, who thinks the Spice Girls will win? And who doesn't really know their own opinion? Yeah, good. Well done, Tasia. That's the right answer. Um, here's a couple of guys arguing. Ferociously. Why, why are these pictures important? I'll leave that back in the ground. Oops. Now you see now the structure underneath the cardboard stand up. 
Right. Before we look at the passage, which is quite a difficult passage for us in our, um, in our cultures, it deals with sensitive issues, um, we've, we've thought about arguments. Can you imagine what church life would be like if all the men were arguing about how we should behave and all the women were trying to tell the men how to calm down and leave it alone and be bossy and big and bold? Like the Spice Girls were on stage, really. I don't know what they're like in real life, but on stage they were bold and brass, brassy. So, we need to keep that idea in mind as we read 1 Timothy chapter 2. Because Paul's letter is a pastoral letter to a young overseer called Timothy, a young guy who oversaw the church, with instructions on how to bring peace to an argumentative church family. Every one of us will have had good experiences and bad experiences of relationships in church life. Sometimes men will have behaved very badly towards women, and sometimes women will behave very badly towards men. And we'll see in this passage why relationships are sometimes bruising and sometimes beautiful, but never perfect. And these verses are some of the most hotly contested verses in the Bible because they deal with some of the most sensitive issues in our society. But they've been put here by God for our good and for the good of society. And so before we look at the teaching, let's just think about ourselves so that we listen carefully and pastorally. I pray I'll speak carefully and pastorally. And I, I, I hope it's all of God. But please, please be, feel free to come and speak to me about it afterwards. So you see, as we study the Bible, we need to be very aware of our own personalities and our own perspectives and our own attitudes and our own experiences and our own culture. And we know that different people at different times and different times in history have read these verses that we're about to read very differently in some cultures, and sometimes these verses have been understood to liberate women. Let me give you two examples. Firstly, verse 11, if you look at it, says that women should learn. And that learning is not limited to only the study of God's truth and the gospel, but it is all truth that women are liberated to study sciences and literature and history and all sorts of subjects. Women are to learn freely. And also, Paul's teaching is we understand to liberate women who faced pressure from men or competition from other women to dress in indecent or alluring ways. So, when Paul says, verse 9, I want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, the teaching liberates women from wearing corsets or having tiny feet or wearing boob tubes or tight sari tops or whatever is a body, in, body enhancing uh, shaping way of clothes is not modest or decent. So being expected to dress modestly, being expected to dress pr with propriety and decency, with faith and love and good deeds, uh, is found by many women to be liberating. So at the same time as liberation, these Verses have also been understood at different times to be deeply oppressive and misogynistic. That men oppress women. Verse 12 has been read that way when Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. So in the battle of the equality of the sexes in today's culture, these verses seem to be a kind of historic sexism and they should be confined to the dustbin of history. So we need to keep those two extremes in mind as we carefully try and unpick what Paul is saying in Timothy's context in the church of Ephesus, in a church that was filled with angry disputes, as we saw last week, and we'll see this week in verse 8. So, uh, as we thought about in the first week, there was false teaching that was creating controversy in church, it was creating disagreements, and... and um, that was being brought by false teachers who were teaching a different gospel to the gospel of Christ. 
So from verse 8 to 15, Paul focuses on the conduct first in verse 8 of men and then the rest of the verses on the conduct of women. And so as we study this, let's look at it as wisdom, not law. Law comes with penalties and we're obliged to keep the law. Um, Wisdom comes as principle for life. And if we have acted foolishly in the past, we mustn't beat ourselves up too badly because... We are those who are covered by the grace of Jesus Christ, and we are to grow in his wisdom. I just want to say lastly, before we read the passage, that the passage has nothing about the relative abilities of men and women, or the relative intelligence of men and women. These are about peace and power in church life, and how power should be exercised, or authority should be exercised, in a way that brings peace so there's three headers in the, in the reading, um, in, the, in the order of service. Uh, under the reading, you'll see avoiding anger disputes. First, accepting created order. Secondly, understanding how God cursed the world after the fall. And third, working together in submission to Christ. Good. I think that's the introduction that we need, and, and I hope um, it sets up the reading for us. Let me pray, and then we'll read 1 Timothy 2, 8-15. Lord, you are only well aware of my personal anxieties in preaching this passage of your word. I pray that we would trust it is your word and that it is filled with your wisdom and goodness. I pray, Lord, that I would handle it as a workman approved by you. Uh, I pray, Lord, that I would speak truthfully, carefully, compassionately. And Lord, anything that I say which is not of you and which is inherently wrong and sinful, I pray, Lord, for your mercy and forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read together these few verses, starting with verse 8. You'll find it in the order of service. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety among adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with the good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But God, women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. This is the word of the Lord. Just wait for the door to open and close. Morning. Okay, we're going to look at these three headers. Let's start with accepting created order. We know from the Bible that when God created the world, he created it with good order. It wasn't chaotic. He made day and night, land, sea and sky, light and dark, male and female. And all of creation, therefore, is ordered by God, and there is both difference in creation but also equality like salt and pepper hot and cold wet and dry male and female and all human beings are unique and yet we are all made in the image of God and before God we have equal status and equal dignity and equal value and worth And as God ordered creation, that's what Paul points us to in verse 13. If you look with me in that verse, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now why is this important? What has this got to do with arguments and authority and power in church life and in the world? Well, it's important because it's a summary of Genesis chapter 2, in which we are shown that first of all God created Adam, then God gave Adam the law, 
which was how he was to obey God, and then he created Eve. And so that meant that Adam had received the law before Eve had been created, and it was therefore Adam's responsibility to pass on what he'd been told to Eve. Once she'd been informed of what God had said about the law, do not eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, then they were both individually responsible for obeying the law. Um, to get my head around this, I'm going to use my own sons as an illustration. If I say to Gillis, look, Mum and I are going to bed now, I want you and your brother to be in bed by midnight, it's church tomorrow, um, please tell your brother, Gillis has received the law from his dad, it's his responsibility now to tell Elliot. Once Elliot's been told, they both have individual responsibility to go to bed before midnight. And then Gillis doesn't need to tell Elliot again. Elliot might want to say, what, what time did Dad say we should go to bed? Oh yeah, midnight. But Gillis is not responsible for making sure that Elliot obeys the law. Uh, Elliot is a moral agent with his own responsibility. And that's what it's like with Adam and Eve and God. God gave Adam the responsibility to teach Eve and, and they therefore then had individual responsibility and individual moral agency. So, Eve could always check with Adam, what did God say about that tree? But he wouldn't be able to uh, enforce that. She was her own moral agent. And that's just the way God made the world. He created order, and it's in this order that Paul wants to see order restored in the church where men and women are arguing and fighting and having heated disputes as the women try and boss the men around and tell them to, to calm down. So, um, verse 8, we're told that men are to pray together, lifting up holy hands. Last week, so that was a, a sign of peace. You can't pray with, you shouldn't pray with clenched fists. And, then, and so rather than angrily disputing with each other, pray. And then the women... Uh, verse 12, not to teach or instruct the men or um, exercise authority over them or boss them around. Uh, verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man, she must be quiet. So when we accept God's created order, it results in peaceful and quiet lives. Uh, which is what Paul said we were to pray for at the start of chapter 2. We may live, may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Now you might be wondering at this point if I'm going to speak about um, whether women should preach or not in church. Um, is it right when uh, men are present for a woman to be a preacher? Is that what Paul meant when he said, I do not permit a woman to teach her authority? Um, I'm going to leave that question until we've covered chapters 3 and 4, because they shed light back on this verse. But in the meantime, I'm going to commend to you a book about um, a, written, a book written by a lot of Christian women. It's edited by a lady called Sharon Dickens, who's uh, from Edinburgh. And the, um, the book's called Unexceptional, Ordinary Women Doing Extraordinary Things Through God. And so um, we the book is normally five ninety nine. If you buy ten copies, we get them for three pounds each. So if you would like a copy, please ask Sunita to order one for you. And, um, and I encourage you to read it. It's a, a book written by women who are doing ministry in really difficult um, places, uh, like the estates of Edinburgh and Middlesbrough and some places in America. So um, let's summarize the first point. We are to accept created order for human beings. God's created order. We're all made in the image of God, and yet we are male and female. We have equal value, but we are different in order. Adam was made first, then Eve. So just ask yourself the question, do you view each other as church members, as image bearers of God? Do you see each other as equally valuable before God? And do you accept that created order of male and female? Secondly, how did God curse the world after the fall? In verse 14, Paul writes this. Adam was not the one deceived, 
It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. That's the summary of the fall, or the time that Adam and Eve sinned against God. But Eve sinned first. Now, sin has obviously ruined the world. Sin has made the world chaotic and disastrous. But it's not just sin, because God himself cursed the world after the fall. In the fall, um, we, we know that Eve decided it was right that she should break God's law. She decided it was right for herself. She desired knowledge of good and evil. She saw the fruit was pleasing to the eye. She took some and she ate it. And then she gave some to her husband who was with her. And as she gave it to her husband, at that point, Eve dominated Adam. She took the lead. She made the decision. He just followed her. She didn't say to him, Adam, what did God say? Or, should we eat this fruit? She just made the decision herself. She was a moral agent with freedom to do that. Adam had backed down his responsibility to remind her of what he'd been told by God. And together, they then reversed the created order. She took the lead and he followed. After that, they hid from God. And when God exposed what they had done... What happened? A heated argument. A big dispute. Adam pointed the finger at Eve and said, This woman, you, God, put here with me. She did it. Angry blame. And then Eve blamed the serpent. And nobody took responsibility for their actions. They just pointed the finger of blame. It was the first conflict, the first heated dispute. So God put a curse on men and women because of that first sin. The goodness of created order became cursed chaos. And there were five curses that God placed on his people. And Paul reminds us of one of those curses in verse 15. He says, women will be saved through childbearing. The first curse that God said was, Women, you will experience severe pain as you give birth to your children. The second curse, the woman would be filled with desire for her husband. Thirdly, the man was going to dominate his wife, boss her around, push her down, squash her. So we need to make sure that we are aware that the subjugation of women by men Men, if they treat women as second class, is a result of the fall where God cursed relationships. Eve had sinfully dominated Adam at the fall, now Adam would sinfully dominate Eve. Fourth curse was the ground, that God cursed the ground and made it hard work to grow food, which used to just be plucked from trees. And then lastly, Men and women would die physically, and their bodies would return to the dust. The gospel is this, that Jesus Christ came to break all five curses. Believers in Jesus wait until the day he returns and finally, finally turns the, blessing, the curses into blessing. And there'll be no more pain, and no more death, and no more power struggles, and no more arguments. So as we wait, verse 15, women will be saved through childbearing, childbirth, if they continue in faith and love and holiness and propriety. You see, Jesus Christ, remember, we were told just at the start of the chapter, came into the world to save sinners. He came to save us all. He died on the cross in the penalty of the law, and his death and resurrection break the curse of the fall. So the cursed chaos becomes recreated order. Love, holiness, and propriety become the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we need to be clear that we, nobody, can add to what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. We are saved through the pain, through the pain of the curse of childbirth, through the pain of work, through the pain of death. We're saved through all that by Jesus' death on the cross. That pain does not add to our salvation. So have you ever seen Bear Grylls on TV? 
I don't think I have, but I know that he climbed Mount Everest when he was 27 years old, and he tells the story of the pain of that climb to the summit of Everest. He reached the summit through pain. Christians are climbing towards glory, towards that new creation through faith in Jesus Christ, who is already there, and he's taking us with him to be there, and the pain of the curses, the pain of childbirth, are a pain that will vanish on the day that we get there. Death and hard work and childbirth pains will be defeated. But what about the painful curses of domination in relationships, of men dominating women and women arguing back? Well, those two things in mind, we come to the third and last point, which is working together in submission to Christ. We've seen that the clear teaching of the Bible is that men and women are cursed by God because of the fall, because of Adam. He was called the first Adam, Jesus Christ is called the second Adam, and Jesus Christ is the righteous one. He is our wisdom, he is uh, our guiding light, he commands us to love one another, he fulfills the desires of our hearts when we love him, and he breaks the curse of sin. So, men, do you know Christ? And women, do you know Christ, the second Adam? Do you desire him? Are we learning in full submission to him? He is the second Adam. So as women in the church, let your desire be for Christ and learn in full submission to him. And by full submission, in this case, Paul saying, at Christ reverses the fall, he, he puts himself back in the place where Adam should have been. So Eve's dominion over Adam is reversed as Eve submits to Christ. And our desires for him mean the desire she has for her husband become blessed desires through faith in Jesus Christ. And women uh, who submit to Christ will then not become or will try not to be the bossy, domineering Eve towards their husbands or church brothers. And so you see, men in our, our situation, our responsibility is to put ourselves back under the second Adam and to become the Adams we were meant to be. We're meant to grow in knowledge, grow in instruction, grow in guidance, grow in wisdom from Jesus Christ, submit to his commands, love our wives as Christ loved the church in Ephesians 5, it must be very clear to everybody that men are not somehow the source of all wisdom. It is Jesus who is the source of all wisdom, the second Adam. And so women, as, you, as men's responsibility to seek Christ, so your responsibility to seek Christ, to seek knowledge, to seek instruction, to seek guidance and wisdom from Jesus Christ, to submit to his commands and not to boss men around. And that order under Christ is, what is good for our families, is good for our churches, and good for our communities, and good for society as a whole, and good for the glory of God. So men are not to shirk responsibility and pass it to their wives, like Adam did at the fall. Men were not to pass the buck to the, our wives. How many men do sport or DIY on a Sunday, or gardening, or something else, while they um, wife and, and children go off to church to seek God and grow. All people in the start of chapter 2 are to be saved. Salvation is one thing. And then grow in the knowledge of the truth. There's plenty of men who are not growing in the knowledge of the truth. All the while their wives and children steam ahead. And, and men, we, we're not to shirk that responsibility. We will make bad decisions. We will make bad choices. And the women know that very well. And that makes it very difficult for women not to try and boss their husbands around and guide them, instruct them. But if women do that, then men will never take responsibility as they should. Just remember back to when Amanda and I were first married. She'd been a Christian for 14 years when we got married. 
I've been a Christian for two. I had a lot of learning to do, a lot of growing knowledge to do. And Amanda is intellectually more clever than I am. You all know that. Um, she's naturally more, um, more intelligent. But she will tell you that she's understood from this passage that it would not be good for me as a husband, nor for our family, nor for our marriage, nor for this church, nor for our society, if she tried to boss me around and tell me how to live. Now, you can imagine 26 years ago, that wasn't easy. I was young and foolish then, I'm old and foolish now, but Amanda had to, had to make sure she, she didn't try and take responsibility away from me. But we didn't all, we, we, we still don't get it right. We, I still fall back into shirking or trying to dominate Amanda, and then she tries to take a stand or take a lead. Lots of times there were arguments in our first few years of marriage, lots of arguments. And we've been working those things through ever since. We're still climbing through the curse and the pain to glory. So as created orders restored in Christ, everybody, everybody knows their place and seeks to avoid those arguments, seeks to avoid trying to take control. Men are given a chance to take responsibility and women their responsibility under Christ. And so we grow together in the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ and in peace. As we come to the end, I just want to say that next week we're going to learn about why churches need elders in order to function and how those elders to be people with, or to be men with good character and avoid our arguments. And then we're going to go on in chapter 4 into more detail about how men and women are to relate. But for now, let's just take this from this passage. We are to accept God's created order, male and female. We are to understand how the curse has affected us and our relationships. And we are to look to Jesus Christ, the second Adam, as our only teacher and Lord. Shall we pray? Lord, we come to you acknowledging that this teaching is unusual to our ears in this generation. Lord, in a generation where there is a battle for the equality of the sexes, we pray that this teaching would be refreshing to us, liberating, and that it would create your order in our lives, in our families, in this church and in our society for your glory. Lord, help us to acknowledge where we have followed the patterns of Adam and Eve at the fall or have been subject to the curse which you put upon life. And we pray, praise you, Jesus, that you are the curse breaker, the penalty taker, the one who liberates us from the law and its penalties, but who gives us who gives us wisdom under you as our great, great second Adam. We pray you'd help us as a church to work these things through and to talk about them openly to the glory of your name. Amen. I suggest we take a moment to pause and reflect. Maybe reflect on your own family situation. Reflect on the life of our church. And reflect on our society in the UK. Let's pray for the church. Almighty God, who built your church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus, Jesus as the chief cornerstone, 
Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, our risen King, we pray that we would do everything to ensure that you are always in place as our chief cornerstone. Join us together, O Holy Trinity, in unity of spirit. Help us always to listen to the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, carefully discerning the word of truth. We pray for the church and this nation that your people would not be afraid to speak the truth of the gospel to their neighbours, serving them in all godliness and humility and love. We pray for the work of the Evangelical Alliance, the Church of England Evangelical Council, and our Diocesan Evangelical Fellowship here in Litchfield, that the saints would be united in strengthening one another to bring your glorious gospel to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray for the world. Lord, we bring before you the leaders of various nations of the world. We pray that in your grace and mercy you would intervene and help those who are suffering so greatly in so many nations. We pray that the world leaders would seek after wisdom and justice, mercy and truth, freedom, godly grace, and a desire to grow in your truth more and more. We pray that in your pity and kindness you would intervene in countries where there is war, corruption and injustice, bringing them righteous leaders of integrity. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray for the people of Afghanistan. Lord, we pray after the attack near a school in Kabul. Please bring your peace, we pray. Bring healing to the injured and your light to the bereaved. We pray for those who continue to suffer the pandemic, especially those in India, Lord, those in Pakistan and the Philippines where healthcare systems are under severe pressure. Give perseverance to all who care for the sick, wisdom to those making decisions, and your grace to all who are suffering or mourning. Lord, raise up generosity in the nations like ours, which have already been widely vaccinated and have healthcare system has coped. Help us personally to be generous, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we pray for Jason and Tracy, our link missionaries in Thailand, and for their daughters Libby and Ruby. Please give Jason and Tracy wisdom as they conclude their time as school dorm parents this month. Help them to bring a good end to their time with the children they've been caring for. And give Jason and Tracy grace as they continue their work with your people in Thailand. May their love for you shine through in all they do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's pray for our community, this parish. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to love our neighbour as ourselves and to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. We pray for those who live in this parish and in our town. They would come to know your love. Please give us strength for our work and service, hope in our troubles, and wisdom in our decision making. Give us grace to comfort the fearful and to assure the isolated of our love and your love for your name's sake. Amen. We thank you for those appointed in our elections this week. We pray especially for Laura Rollins, re elected as councillor. For Simon Foster, the new Police and Check Crime Commissioner, and for Andy Street, re-elected as West Midlands Mayor. May they serve diligently with wisdom and perseverance as they, as they look over all people in this area. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick. Almighty and eternal God, have mercy upon all who are sick. In their days of weakness, strengthen their faith. Lead them to repentance and teach them to live the rest of their lives in your fear and in your glory, so that in the last they may live with you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
In a moment of silence, let's name before God all we know who are in need of God's mercy and strength in their sickness. May all who know you, uh, may all who mourn, Lord, may all who grieve know your comfort and have a sure confidence in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Welcome, guys. We've, um, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together, which is in the order of service. Just uh, as his intercessions at the top of the page. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Welcome, guys. We're almost at the end. We're going to look at the three, um, three articles of, of the Church of England, or Anglican faith, um, on the sacrament of the supper, so uh, articles 28, 29, and 30. Do you want to stand and get a bit of circulation going, and then we'll just read these together? Um, just be careful. This, this, was, this is modernised language from 1662. In fact, it was written in 1552, so it's, it's about 500 years old. So we're going to read 28, which is of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Lord's Supper is what we celebrate at the table when we're allowed to. We're going to be talking about that at the PCC in two weeks' time. So, the Lord of the Lord's Supper, let's read. The Supper of the Lord is not only a sign of the love that Christians ought to have among themselves, one to another, but rather is a sacrament of our redemption by Christ's death, insomuch that we, st- so as, as to rightly, worthily, and with faith, receive the same. The bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ. Transubstantiation, or the change of the substance of the bread and wine, in the supper of the Lord, cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture, overthrows the nature of the sacrament, and has given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken and eaten in the supper only after a heavenly and spiritual manner, and the means whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. Let's turn the page 29. Of the wicked which eat not the body of Christ in the use of the Lord's Supper. Let's read. The wicked, and as such as be void of any lively faith, although they do carnally and visibly press with their teeth, as St. Augustine say, the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, yet in no wise are they partakers of Christ, but rather to their condemnation do eat and drink the sign or sacrament of so great a thing of both kinds, number 30. The cup of the Lord is not to be denied to the lay people for both parts of the Lord's Supper by sacraments, uh, Christ's ordinance and commandment ought to be ministered to all Christian men alike. And by men, it means men and women. Do take a seat. Um, this is all we need to know about communion in three dense paragraphs. So um, let me take you through it very quickly. As we receive communion, when we can do so again, as we gather round the communion table, we are to have love for one another. But more than that, it is a sacrament of redemption. That means that Jesus has redeemed his people. He's brought us back from the curse 
of sin and of the penalty of death. So, all who worthily receive the sacrament by faith and rightly, after repentance for sin, then receive the body and blood of Christ by faith. And very quickly we're told that transubstantiation, which is that the the wine becomes the blood and the body becomes uh, the bread becomes the body, is not something that can be proved by Scripture and actually just breeds a whole bunch of superstitious nonsense, uh, gobbledygook or mumbo jumbo. So we receive the body of Christ uh, in the bread, not because the bread has become the body, but we receive it. As the body is, we trust in Jesus Christ himself, by faith in him. We have faith that he died for our sins, faith that he's broken the curses of sin. And so um, we receive both the the body and the blood by um, faith, or the bread and the wine by faith, trusting in the body and blood of Christ. So we're not to worship the stuff on the table. It's just bread and wine. The stuff on the table is to to help us in our faith in Christ. So, does that mean that everybody who comes to the table and eats the bread and drinks the wine is saved from their sin? No. In fact, as as St. Augustine said, we can eat eat the bread and the wine, but in such a way to increase our condemnation to increase our judgment from God. And so we must come with true repentance for sin and a lively faith in Jesus Christ as Saviour. And anybody who doesn't have those two things simply makes their judgment worse. Of both kinds, and this is one of the issues that we've had to discuss as a church through the lockdown, um, everybody has received both the bread and the wine. We are members of the same body. Uh, we share in the same faith. So that's the, that's a sort of summary of quite a lot of thinking about communion. It's just a very quick summary. When you come to communion together, love one another, trust in Jesus Christ, repent of sins, eat and drink by faith in him, not in the bread and wine. Notices before we sing. Um, I, how is the weather looking outside? Will anyone be able to check? Just two notices this week. Oh, I've got a thumb up. Um, there's, church life is, very, is still very reduced. I think we're going to be uh, discussing it at PCC in a couple of weeks' time, coming out of lockdown. And um, In the meantime, we have got two church government meetings coming up. The first is two weeks today. It'll be immediately after this service. And um, it's called the annual Prochial Church Meeting. That's the annual church elections. And, and we receive reports of church life. So we've got annual, annual reports. Please take your annual report. Um, you don't have to be a church member to receive one. You can, anyone here today can take one. They're in a blue box on top of the communion rails at the door. So please take um, a big copy for those who, whose eyesight can't read the small print. And if you can read small print, take a small copy. And uh, that will give you an idea of um, what happened in church life between January and December last year, which wasn't very much. And then um, the f- uh, if you'd like to um, enter onto the electoral roll, the electoral roll is the list of people who are members of the church who have the right to, to vote or to stand for election and there are, there are certain stipulations you've got to satisfy to be on that list um, but Mark or I can explain that to you if you want to be included. There's also nomination forms for PCC church wardens um, so if you want to be nominated to stand for election please see Mark. Mark, you want to just wave your hand? That's, Mark's just there you can ask him for a form Um, Normally, the new PCC that's been elected on the church um, APCM will have lunch together and then stay for a meeting afterwards to appoint new officers and and set up the the calendar for the year. 
Um, because we can't have lunch this year, we thought it would take too much time if we held that meeting straight after the APCM. So we're going to have the meeting the following night on the Monday on Zoom. Um, agendas and minutes will be coming out soon. If you have any agenda items, please let Mark know um, if you're a member of the PCC. If you have anything you want to raise in church life, please see one of your PCC members. Um, we will, again this year, put the photograph board back up so everyone can know who the ch church council members are. Great. I think that's our notices. Mrs. Robbie's got one. Oh yes, well remembered. So, uh, two things. Last week I said there was an appeal for uh, a Christian hospital near Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh in India. Uh, they need a um, they need three ventilators and an oxygen making machine for the COVID crisis. Um, there's a Christian charity called South Asian Concern who are coordinating that. And the details are on that piece of paper there at the back. And um, so they need fifty thousand pounds to care for COVID patients. And um, as as Pentecost is coming up soon, when is it? Well, two weeks today is Pentecost uh, Sunday, which is the, the, the birth of the church, the Holy Spirit coming. Um, we've been putting displays in our windows. Maybe you've been doing that. If you haven't, maybe you could do this. It's a colouring sheet, which is also available on the way out, I think. Yes, on the sanitising station. Do colour in this um, filled with the Holy Spirit colouring sheet. Cut it out, stick it on your window, and let people in our community know that um, the Holy Spirit is alive and we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Oh yes, Mrs. We, we did some gardening on Friday and we chopped down some bay tree and so there's some bay leaves for those who cook with bay, fresh bay leaves in a box over there. Um, shall we go and sing outside? Uh, the weather has permitted. We're going to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear.